effective for my own use and uh, uh, are really high tech to low tech. Uh, and that's the uh, uh, electronic uh, colloidal silver generators and the uh, magnetic pulse generator that Bob Beck has uh, invented. Many of you know him. But I want to give you all a first hand report on the effectiveness of these tools. Uh, my own personal experience. Uh, the first is the what they call the uh, colloidal generator, and uh, they call it the silver T. There may be a dozen other names for it, but it's uh, basically a little gadget that you can plug in. Uh, it's just a battery powered unit. Uh, it's small enough to carry in shirt pocket or add a, a money clip or something so you can clip it on your belt. And you wear it around during the day. It's a little awkward, but uh, I've worn this particular unit on my belt for uh, about uh, three months this spring. And uh, kept the probes from the unit. Uh, they're just a couple of small stainless steel electrodes that uh, you strap on your wrist and uh, they get rid of all the bacteria, virus, fungus, uh, and probably the little wiggly parasites in your system. Very, very effective. Uh, pulled me out of a situation a year ago. I got a virus when I was down in Dallas in January and the thing really uh, got a hold of me. It got in my brain. I was fuzzy, foggy. I couldn't think. I uh, couldn't focus. I uh, started taking the colloidal silver, uh, eight ounces, uh, a couple times a day. Within four days, my head cleared. I was focused. I could think again and I knew I was well on the way to recover. One of those nasty <laughs> things that you never quite get enough energy to do anything for yourself. So uh, when I finally got on this, uh, despite all of Bob's warnings, uh, don't take drugs, herbs, uh, vitamins, don't smoke, no coffee, da 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 <laughs> went ahead and did it anyway. Didn't change my lifestyle in the least, and it still worked. <laughs> I didn't suffer any side effects. Uh, I can't say that wouldn't happen for somebody else, but uh, either I've got too much iron in my system or, <laughs> or something because it, it didn't affect me. A simple uh, elastic band, uh, a little plastic on it to keep the pads from drying out if you use it long term, like overnight, <coughs> on a 24 hour schedule. Uh, they're placed on the wrist, on the pulse points on either side of the wrist, and just simply uh, pull your strap tight, wear it like that, and the uh, two pulse points right here on the wrist. The uh, wires can go up to your sleeve, uh, down your, you know, inside your shirt, buckle this on, nobody knows it, you can't really tell it from a, uh, uh, What is it actually doing? Oh, it's a, Slim? A pager or a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Slim, what is it actually doing to the blood? What it's actually doing to the blood is putting an electric charge right directly into mm -hmm. the blood. And my personal experience with that is that my energy level came up very, very rapidly, extremely rapidly and it stayed at a very high level. Now, I've worn it continuously, day and night, for three months. And it really wiped out most of the bugs in my system. Now, I wasn't using the other unit, the companion unit, which is called a magnetic pulse generator. The magnetic pulse generator should be used in conjunction with it. 
Is it better than ginseng? Is it better than ginseng? <laughs> well, I tell you what, it makes the ginseng work a lot better. <laughs> uh, I love ginseng, and I'll probably be growing it before too long. So. Uh, this unit is a uh, common, ordinary uh, electronic flash. The electronic flash uh, is wired so that it's part of the circuit and it puts a very high intensity, very sharp magnetic pulse on this coil. Current goes through the coil, creates a pulse of magnetic field that comes out about so far. You can measure that distance with a compass, uh, flash it a few times, see how your compass needle will jump. Now I had a very, very severe sinus infection. I had some bad teeth years ago. I uh, got infection into the, the bone sinus on the right side. And uh, when I was down, just before I went to San Antonio, it got really severe. I, I knew I was in deep trouble. So I started using this unit, uh, just flashing it uh, every few days. <coughs> and just using it like this. And Within two days, uh, all of the distress was gone. The side effects of that were my sinuses drained. I, I mean, I ran like a fire hose. <laughs> I was using three and four handkerchiefs a day and Kleenex by the box. But all of that pressure, uh, chronic sinus I'd had all my life was gone. And I, I continue to use the colloidal silver, and I use that in a, just a spray bottle I keep on the bathroom sink, uh, up my nose, eyes, in my ears, and particularly in my ears at night. I uh, help to restore my hearing, which I had about a 60% hearing loss, and I regained 90% of that uh, since I started using the system. So anybody that's suffering that kind of thing or has a, a chronic uh, throat problem, uh, losing a voice uh, because of uh, a subclinical infection in the uh, throat or larynx, uh, this stuff works. I mean, it really works. And for a uh, two single products, uh, cheap to operate on rechargeable batteries or uh, you know, batteries last in the silver T unit for a couple of months with extensive use. Uh, it's really cheap. And uh, I would have probably spent uh, several thousands of dollars in the doctor's office. I spent uh, 400 bucks on these units. And uh, I was so tickled with it all, that I went to the manufacturer and gave him a report on it and uh, I started distributing the product. So they're available if needed, they're available through Chris Dan here locally. And uh, uh, for emergency use, the colloidal silver is probably the best thing I can think of from my experience. <coughs> Uh, I know a couple of people have used it, uh, associates, distributors, friends, who have used the foil silver on, uh, uh, what's that, uh, uh, melanoma, uh, melanoma cancer on the skin surface. Uh, they put a, you know, just a moisten a, a gauze pad with that and tape it on, keep soaking it with foil silver. Gone usually within a week, very, very short term. So it's an incredible product uh, to kill off bugs of all kinds. Cancer, uh, probably chiggers. Uh, I can tell you what, chiggers, uh, I've used a, uh, uh, a citrus oil product, and I think you can just go out here and squeeze a lemon and get the citrus oil on chigger bites, it probably wipe them out immediately. So that's uh, another product that I can recommend for you know, general cleanup of the system. Seems to really work well.
Okay, I want to get into uh, the rest of the program here today and to, to allow us enough time to have a practice session to work with each other on uh, with the tools. I'm going to run through the outline of what we call the Light Life Program, the use of tools, uh, what they do, uh, we've already discussed in some length, many of you are already acquainted. <coughs> I, I think it's important to know the history of these things and how we came about it. Uh, I call it dumb luck. And other people call it divine guidance. Uh, there's a couple of near misses by the cosmic two by four that got me back on this path. So all of those terms are effective. The uh, ring, of course, was the first uh, development, quite an accidental discovery, a very chance discovery, but it did correlate and fill in a lot of the blanks that we had in some earlier research uh, when we were using uh, Caduceus coils. And there is some existing literature on Caduceus coils but it's very scanty, and as far as I know, it, well, I haven't seen any publications specifically on Caduceus coils. But they, they literally work miracles, and it, it probably relates back into history as far as uh, Moses and the Exodus. Uh, you recall the passage where Moses made a copper serpent? to cure a plague among the Israelites. Okay, well, he didn't just, you know, melt a pot of copper and, and pour it in a mold. He made a specific form. He made a coiled form. Okay. Now, in ancient Numidia, just south of Egypt, there are cave drawings showing people holding coils identical to what we're producing today. Mm. Okay. 3,500 years old. Where is this? Ancient Numidia. Numidia, just south of Egypt here. Uh, a lot more went on in <coughs> northern Africa uh, 3,500, 10,000 years ago than most of us can even imagine. Uh, the second development was the coil, then the feedback loop, which is just a coil, nothing uh, different about it except the, the power uh, factor. The harmonizers, uh, the personal environmental mag harmonizers, uh, the same energy in all of them, uh, just a little different scale of, of function. They, they cover larger areas. Again, I have to stress, we're doing research. I uh, can't make any claims about cures. All I can do is report the results that we have personally experienced or reports of other people in the field who've experienced uh, relief from pain. I can't talk about pain relief because the uh, AMA and the FDA have a patent on the work, <laughs> so nobody can use pain uh, in, in public statement or speech, so I have to say discomfort or aches or something like that. Uh, we are dealing with quantum health. We're dealing with the light body. We're dealing with the two forms of light, visible light uh, or that visible of clairvoyance and the dark light or shock key. Uh, see, dark light form was uh, Rudolf Steiner's term. Uh, shock key is the opposite of key energy. It's the dead life energy. It's the dead orgone energy or DOR, well known right. Uh, orgone energy or biomes was his term. And it's the same thing as prana. I don't know the opposite term in, in the Sanskrit. 
And all of these are in the subtle energy realm. The things that we can see, but we can't photograph. We don't have the instrumentation to see it. We rely on the sensors. <coughs> our own physical sensations of the movement of energy within the body. Uh, meditation is probably the first use and certainly my first uh, understanding of the rain came through meditation. I sat on a rain for about three weeks uh, trying to get myself centered and, and refocused after a near-death experience. Terrible sick, said five, six, seven years ago, and uh, came very close to dying. And what saved my life was soaking in a tub of water that had been run through the ring, which was highly charged, very potent. And uh, I soaked for about 45 minutes, and the fever broke, and I knew I was going to live. But prior to that moment, uh, I had serious, serious doubts. And uh, if any of you have been there and done that, you know what I mean. I feel that in my own personal uh, realm and observably in others that uh, using the tools, meditating the rain tends to uh, calm and focus and bring about a greater understanding or what we could call spiritual development. I've had some experiences using the tools that I'll try to describe, and uh, you're welcome to duplicate them if you like. There is a caveat, it can get real scary, but uh, you'll probably come through it okay. What's it yes. Warrant, C-A-V-E-A-T, it's Latin for beware. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. <laughs> These energies affect physical matter. Uh, it affects water. It changes the structure of water, uh, both by adding energy mm -hmm. and by subtracting the negative energy or negative spin. Uh, we've seen uh, effects on electrical circuits, both in uh, electrical wiring systems and in the human body electrical wiring system. Uh, let's see, Bill Reed had a, uh, a ring on his countertop. Uh, he was potentizing his carrot juice every morning. And he just left it sit there. Uh, the early first rings we made had a positive and a negative side. They were you know, yin yang. Under the counter, he had a uh, uh, cabinet with these uh, mixing bowls in it. And after about three weeks of that ring sitting on the counter, uh, the bowls in the cabinet began to break spontaneously. Uh, one of them broke, just split. Uh, he reached in to you know, pick up the next one, the side came off in his hand. Now this is milk glass. This is hardcore, tough stuff and uh, stoneware pottery. And so that negative energy had changed the structure of those solid materials and brought about a destructive condition. So we don't produce that form anymore. Uh, we had to go back to the drawing board, re-engineer it, make a ring that only has the positive energy on both sides. <coughs> that is uh, a bit of a Rise for us. The change in vibration of uh, solid materials or energy systems in our bodies or in water or in plant life uh, comes about to the change you brought about in water, where the electrons and the atoms in water assume a higher energy state. In other words, they, they jump one shell level to get technical. And this is called a quantum jump, or quantum leap. And this uh, occurs at the most microscopic levels. But we've had the instrumentation on that, we've seen it happen, 
and it can be detected both by the clairvoyant and your own senses uh, through the sense of taste, the sense of feel, and your sensation that something is dramatically different in ordinary water. So that should conclude the presentation on the broad scale of things. I want to get in now to the specifics. And I'm going to jump between. Oh, did everybody get this note up here? Uh, this band has the phone number of the Imperial Welding Supply. Let's see that okay. Researcher into 
to the pyramids and harmonic relationships in the pyramids. And uh, as we get to that section later in the day, I'll, I'll definitely be mentioning some experimental work we did there in January. So, to start with, the, uh, the ring consists of a length of wire, <coughs> originally just a single wire. I'm drawing this as if it were on a straight <coughs> angle. And we have a silver solder junction here, a so called TN junction. That's an electronic term that means positive negative. You can use that positive negative. Because you're joining the positive and negative ends of a piece of wire. Now, to find the positive and negative ends, you ask work with your pendulum. And if you get a counterclockwise rotation, that has a negative effect. Okay, so this would be counterclockwise. This would be clockwise. Okay. And that creates a positive effect. It's not necessarily electrically positive, but it is a positive effect. Okay, so you bring the plus and minus together in one point, and you add plus and minus, you get zero. <coughs> Now, the energy has to go somewhere, and the plane of the ring, this uh, sheet of soap film, so it's a stretch piece of saran wrap or make a soap film on that ring, that is a tensor. That is the official description of a tensor, and it can be made visible. And it shows that there is some kind of an energy field across the, the opening in the ring that will support weight, it will support a you know, soap uh, solution. Now, what actually happens here with the tensor in this area, you generate a flow of energy in a cylinder up and down or on either side of this uh, wire. And <coughs> that energy will have a positive or a negative Effect. <coughs> the, uh, the energy field has a, a very slow motion. It doesn't move very rapidly to the clairvoyant's eye. There's a slight spiral, very slow spiral. But it's the instant that this connection is made and soldered, there is a dis distinct appearance of this cylindrical energy field. It appears instantly, just like switching on a flashlight. You get an instantaneous beam. Okay? Does that happen with any material that you make in, into a loop? Or just metal, just copper? I, th I think any metal <coughs> works. Any metal works. There's some peculiar properties of copper I haven't investigated that very thoroughly, but I hear and read uh, certain people are writing articles about copper having a fourth dimensional property, and that may possibly be the, uh, the energy field around the wire itself. So they call it a fourth dimensional property. So to illustrate that, let's say we had a piece of wire and we magnified it up that big. External to the wire would be a field of energy uh, in here. This would be your solid copper wire. So the length, one dimension, width, height uh, would give you three dimensions, or common perceptions. So outside of that, or at right angles to the third dimension, you have a fourth dimensional effect or a connection. It may be the gravity field effect, and it may also occur in other metals, I'm not sure. Uh, we're getting into technical areas where we don't have good measurements, and we're having to rely on our 
senses, which are probably better than any instrument. So, when we have a negative effect, uh, I mentioned Bill's experience with the uh, uh, Crocker break. Uh, you'll see in uh, the negative effect, for instance, of geopathic stress cells, which may have the same energy, the same negative effect. It cracks across the asphalt, cracks across the road. You'll find a geopathic zone or a Hartman grid line in every one of them. And you may find more than that <coughs> between those cracks in the highway. But you will find 99 times out of 100 that there is a geopathic zone in the crack in the highway. And it will extend clear across you know, infinite lengths. Wouldn't they say mega bucks that they could um, prevent that from cracking highways? Because that's one of their worst problems. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done any test work on that. But I thought about that at one time, you know, just you know, put some copper rods in the, in the roadbed at each of those mm -hmm. crossing points. <coughs> you know, what project? For Bowser's? I mean, you have work from... <laughs> 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 yeah, the kingdom come. Well, the I wonder how many cars it would prove. Yeah. <laughs> Cost a couple pieces of copper wire. What it cost them to patch those cracks? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it would work. I, I truly don't know. Uh, one of the uh, early uh, caveats that came to this. Yeah. One of our research associates had uh, uh, he had an accident in the uh, uh, swimming in the ocean one time. He got dumped on his head by a wave, big wave, and uh, stretched his back backward, got arched like that. And he had chronic problems for 15 years. And he had all kinds of chiropractors work on him all kinds of medications and uh, medical assistance, none of which was working. Uh, he started having uh, what he thought was heart attacks, but they could find no evidence on the EKGs or whatever instrument they used. They couldn't find evidence for heart attacks. So it was a light one, but not like one. So we finally, uh, we finally deduced that uh, uh, it was a nerve pinch you know, from this dislocation. Uh, the nerves controlling the heart would get pinched and you move a certain way, all of a sudden you'll know, get this spasm and go down. So, uh, Bill and I were working on him with uh, the coils and trying to relieve some of the pain that he had in the back and his hips locking up. Some, some mornings he tried to get out of bed and couldn't move his legs. Well, that's kind of uncomfortable. So, we chased this pain up and down his back for about four or five sessions. And he worked on himself with a coil and his wife worked on him. And uh, uh, he was gradually getting rid of the, the back pain, releasing the, some of the spasms. You know, I'm going to fix my heart. So he held the uh, negative side of the ring up to his heart. And instantly it stopped. It <laughs> turned off the electronics. <laughs> and about the time he hits the floor, he says, Oops. <laughs> <laughs> turned it over. <laughs> and instantly the heart started. Okay. He's, he's a good researcher. He's got a quick really good And uh, his heart started up, and uh, he, was, he was okay for that day. We later uh, had a, a 
just a few days later, uh, we met him in uh, the intensive care unit. He'd been taken there by ambulance with another one of these heart spasms. We had him on the monitor and showing a very irregular heartbeat. I'll try to illustrate what we saw. There is just a jigging here. And then it went on like this, the same repeated jig in there. Very abnormal pattern right here. So Bill took a coil and was holding it to the back of the heart shop, <coughs> right back in here. And uh, I was watching, you know, watching, watching his facial features and his uh, watching the body shift very subtly as it began to balance. <coughs> and within two minutes, this chart went to an absolutely normal, regular beat system. I mean, it was just absolutely a perfect rhythm. There was no irregularity of any kind in the heart. And the doctor came in later in the day and looked at his uh, <laughs> At, at the monitor there, and she said, my God, you, you've recovered. What, what did you do? So I said, I had a couple of friends come in and do some magic on her. <laughs> and uh, the doctor said, well, uh, if, if you're stable for another four hours and we don't see any change in that, in that pattern, you can go home now. So at 8 o'clock, he was released. And he's had a clean bill of health since. Now, there is one more part to that story. In his own treatment of himself using the coils and the rings, uh, we got him a, a, a new variety of ring very quickly. And uh, he had a bright idea. And he laid down on the floor and taped a ring to his toe. So it was right on the so foot. They just lay down on the floor, a ring on each foot. And after about 45 minutes, there was a spontaneous and complete realignment of the spine. He said it just relaxed him. <laughs> and he's never had another problem with his heart, no more problems with his hips. He doesn't have I have to mention that his electrical system, his nerve system, was in such bad shape that he was pulling in negative energy. His aura was black. He had uh, a very gray cast to his skin, and his, his pores were filled with this negative energy. It looked like blackheads. And, and some of them were as you know, big as a quarter of an inch. Not pockmarked, but he had this, this huge gobs of this negative energy stuck in the skin. Now, the last time I saw him, uh, which was about, let's see, that was two, two years ago, and that would have been four years following his recovery, his skin was bright pink. His aura was just as clean and good as any I've ever seen. And he had not one single problem, physical problem, or medical problem in the intervening four years. A major change in his life pattern, because he'd been continually plagued with medical problems, financial problems, etc., etc., uh, largely because his thought pattern was toward the negative, and he was able to recover all of his mental faculties. Well, it's, it's physical, and his life is dramatically different. I, I wouldn't, I would not have recognized him if I'd have met him on the street. He had to give me his name because I didn't recognize him. The change was that dramatic. But that had occurred over you know, the intervening four years when I hadn't seen him. So those were, that was our early, one of our very early successes using the tools, and incidentally a, a very good
good piece of research that this gentleman did for us. Uh, Who is this? A gentleman named Gene Sparks. And uh, he was uh, responsible for you know, that discovery of the effects of the negative energy and impressing on us that we dare not let that first product out uh, in the public. So, based on that, we decided we'd better form a research association and uh, have the caveats that everybody's kind of on their own to do the research and use the equipment uh, at their own discretion, uh, but with certain, you know, I'll try to give all the warnings that there are. Uh, the, the worst thing I've seen happen in the use of the tools is the detox. The person starts detoxing, they panic, it may be vomiting, and diarrhea, uh, maybe just a, a huge lethargy, they just have to sleep, and that's a, a detoxing reaction. And uh, that's the worst that I've seen happen uh, with the tools. Uh, ordinarily, we consider that a benefit. And healers in general look at detoxing as a, as a very positive sign. So that's, that's the worst effect that I've seen in the use of these. Is this in the rings? Or the rings, oils, anything else. Uh, just a detoxing effect. Uh, now, I need to go back to the drawing board here and try to illustrate some of the effects of the foil. And I'm illustrating what I'm trying to illustrate is principles. And then that way you can take that principle and apply it in other areas. And just let your imaginations kind of run with it. Uh, as I know it's already happened. Uh, the 20.6 inch length, that's about right, uh, 20.6. Okay, that relates to the five inch sides of the boss in the pyramid. Okay, that sticks out an inch from the wall in the pyramid. Of the what? what? An inch from the wall. This What's the word thing? boss means? Uh -huh. B-O-S-S. -S. Yeah, what does it mean? Well, okay. Uh, this belt buckle has a curve in it. It's bossed. It has a, uh, an embossing on it. Oh, it's like embossing. Oh, okay. so this is called the boss, and it's, it's just a projected uh, plate out here. Okay, this thing is a, approximately five inches on the side, here, here, and here. And it's one inch in this dimension. It's called the pyramid inch. That's the smallest standard measurement they used. And then the why they have a five inch length, I don't know. But five of these inches divide each side. And this pyramid inch is slightly larger, I think it's one point oh oh five one approximately larger than our standard British inch, which is a derivative of this. Our standard British inch should be this length. And then it would be a, a full one inch. The, uh, the perimeter of the boss then is approximately 20 inches, four times five. Turns out to be 20.6. Uh, English inches, there's a slight difference in those lengths, but uh, we're going to use the, the pyramid measurement in British inches. This is also called the sacred cuba.
a little bit longer than my arm from here to here, which is the usual concept of cube. Okay, we take this, it has a positive and a negative end. We fold, fold it in half. <coughs> right back on itself, so you have positive and negative in the same location. There's an energy flow in the wire. It flows in this direction. Natural flow of energy in a piece of wire just being held right here. Okay. When you fold it back on itself and twist it, you cancel any magnetic field so that these become additive and zero. So this is a null magnetic field. Okay, now we bend this into a circle. We have a zero field, zero magnetic field, but a high electric field circulating through the PN junction. So the positive negative junction allows current to flow only in one direction. So you're flowing it in one direction. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you have graphically a voltage, so you have 10 volts here, and you create a dead short, <clears throat> the voltage drops to zero on the line here. And your amperage or current goes up toward infinity. This is a standard electrical field phenomenon. That's what burns out wires when you're pumping power in there. The current goes to infinity, meets more resistance in the wire, and burns it out. Here we have a current running, but it's a fairly weak current. It doesn't matter. It builds up enormously to become nearly infinite. That energy is transferred at 90 degrees from the wire into this plane, becoming a tensor. <coughs> we don't know where electricity comes from, or where electrons come from, but they probably, they probably come out of the gravity field and they're captured by spinning copper wire and generators. Now we have a still copper wire, and we have a current flowing at an approximately an infinite range, which is translated at 90 degrees across the plane and at 90 degrees in this direction. So this, if we create a cylinder here with an infinite power source, we have an infinite amount of power available. And this the range of this thing we know is 10 miles. We've measured the effects of it 10 miles from uh, my back porch up to Bob's lap where he had the instrument. Okay, I swept a beam of the ring along the horizon, intersected his view field running scanner, and you could see it. You could see the changes. So <coughs> that's some of the technical stuff behind the ring. Uh, any questions here? Yes, sir. <laughs> let me let me catch the back corner first. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Does the uh, the size of the ring of the projection does that begin to broaden by light? No. As, as, as the distance? No, it seems to be very coherent very coherent. In other words, it would be like a laser. Okay. Uh, the thing that causes light to diverge is resistance, and apparently uh, this field has no resistance in it. In other words, the, the energy cylinder, this vector, or the carrier, uh, does not need any resistance, so there's no divergence. <coughs> it, uh, if you look at it in those terms, it's technically a superconducting channel. I think 
neat stuff, neat potentials. Okay. Uh, you know, these are these are the phenomena that we can observe. Is the probability? And I can only say probability that this is a superconducting uh, channel or vector. We see it. We can create a superconducting space in a large area using the harmonics. Okay. So the, all the resistance, all the static. Uh, it was out of that field, as witnessed by the clarity of television and radio reception. You know, if you, when you tune a radio, you know there's a little static between the stations. Uh, when you're using these harmonizers in concert, create a large field over a long distance. Uh, the silence between the radio stations is absolutely astounding. No static, no fuzz. Your stations come in perfectly clearly. And, and unless you've heard it, you can't even imagine it. So. Is that with the harmonizer or the? Yeah, using the coil. Or coil. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, another question. Okay. You said about bending it over, so you. I'm trying to figure out this, this wire. You okay. take it this way and you bring it back and then you wrap it around? No, you, or do you, you take it that it, way? It's twisted. Twist it first. Twist it first. Right. To okay. the right. Don't ever twist it to the left. Okay, so you don't As twist it around the straight it. wire. No. You just twist it. Okay. Yeah. You twist it together. Uh -huh. Bent in a circle. Cut to this length. Oh, I see. Okay, so twist so it first, bend it in half. So every every one of these, what looks like two pieces of wire, that's one piece of wire. You know, okay. You get the topology of that. <coughs> so it's just one wire twisted and then put in a circle. Okay. So the each hoop is so many measurements of 20.6 inches. Right. Does it have to be soldered? Uh, probably. Uh, if you can find a good uh, butt splice uh, <coughs> system, you probably use a mechanical crimp. Just, I know why I've been doing So just yeah. bending it through the loop of the initial bend is not good enough. It needs to be soldered. Yeah, yeah it should, should be a, a soldered joint. Mm -hmm. That gives you that positive negative junction. It's a weak one, mind you, but we're working with weak forces that yield enormous forces. Uh, some, there seems to be a different feeling or, or quality of energy with each of the different sized rings. Is, is there a change in the, in the amplitude of the energy that's, that's being emitted, if I'm using that word correctly? Um, no, apparently, and what the uh, our quality control clairvoyant tells us, is <laughs> it's the same density of energy. Now, there may be a slightly different vi vibratory quality, but the density is the same. In other words, the, the field strength is identical no matter what size of the unit you have. In other words, there's, if we divided this up into uh, small squares and said there's so many <coughs> herbs per uh, cubic centimeter. It would be the same in every one. You would have the same uh, infinity of the energy in each one. Just one more question. Uh, in case you try to filter your own material, how do you make sure that both sides are emitting positive energy? It is not that effect that you find in your first. By twisting, bending the loop back on itself, doubling the wire, and twisting it to the right. And I can't emphasize that enough. If you twist it to the left, that is having a negative Well, that's double bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
determine that run over your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so a single wire will produce a positive and a negative. Right. And if you did a, a looped wire and did it to the left, it would be a negative emitting on both sides? Yeah, we had to certify that, and that's why we're extremely careful. Occasionally, the, the kid winding the wire there in the shop for us, and even I've done it, uh, will hit the reverse button on the drill motor, and you know, just not thinking, pick it up and start it, we don't pay attention to which way it's rotating. So if you're using a reversible drill, you'll <laughs> sure tape down that switch. Is there any practical theoretical uses of the negative? Energy? I I don't want that karma running over my dog. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I, I don't want that karma on my shoulders. Yeah, I've taken a lot of pains to define these terms and to certify in our own mind that that left hand side does not do anybody any good. It is totally destructive of living systems. Work. The size of the ring are multiple <coughs> 20.6. Yes, everything is in multiple or division of 20.6. And uh, we're using. Have, have an equal uh, amount of. We're, we're using uh, even one cubit, uh, half cubit, uh, three and a half. Uh, we found that the three and a half, of course, is, is half of the magic seven. And somehow there, there could probably be some numerological considerations here, but we found the uh, three and a half cubit lengths uh, for the large rings and then the lengths for the coil and the feedback. That that's a magic number, and those work better than any other uh, multiple. And how long does the wire have to be to coil the 20.6? Is, is the length of the wire that you coil 20.6? Okay, the, the, the twist of the wire here, yeah, we twist it and cut it to 20.6. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. So what is the length of the wire itself to, to get to that point, and how did you determine the uh, width of the coil? Ring? Yeah, ring. I mean, no, the, uh, the coiled wire of the ring. <coughs> Width. Okay, just this this yeah, here. Uh, we're using 12 gauge wire on that, the, the very softest possible copper. And you'll find two grades, uh, just you know, like asking for the softest possible mm -hmm. bare wire. Uh, that uh, that has some probably has some implications as to the gauge. Uh, 12 being another magic number, another harmonic number that, that works in a lot of different systems. And I think the ancients used what they called the sexagesimal system based on 60. Uh, sixes, threes, twelves, and uh, of course the <coughs> triangular form. Uh, they used that system which seems to be more in concordance with uh, universal geometry. Uh, uh, was it Buckminster Fuller said that that's the basic shape. Uh, you can't get any better than that. And it's curious, uh, I think in your workbooks you'll find a, a print uh, showing the uh, graphics of the ring. Yeah, this this print uh, that's uh, a scan of the energy field in the ring. Is that from Bob's equipment? Yeah, that's scanned with Bob's uh, uh, molecular scanner. And uh, when we were first beginning to research together, uh, I 
asked him to scan the ring, just scan right through the center of it. He said, there's nothing there. I can't scan it. I can't get a picture. You know, it's impossible. And uh, since I knew that there was, quote, something the, uh, the tension or the plane of stillness, I, I knew that he'd get a reading. And uh, it took me about four months to convince him to do that. <laughs> and we've done, of course, several other experiments, but the, the print that showed up there, of course, shows a, an extremely geometric pattern. And you'll notice that right in the center of it appears to be a tube. There's an open space uh, right down the center of that print. Uh, this, this is a little dark and uh, not quite as clean a print as you know, the originals. But the patterns that you can see there are extremely self-consistent and very balanced. <coughs> we would like eventually to be able to get our computer capacity uh, tied into the scanner so that we can have a live, real-time view of this. What he has to do is take a quick snapshot and then quote, develop it mm -hmm. through the uh, program in the computer. It takes about 20 minutes to print out this particular uh, pattern. It's quite tedious even on a computer. But if we could get up to real time, I think we would see that this thing rotates. Either rotates in a plane like this in the ring, or rotates uh, within itself, uh, like the tube chorus. Uh, if that's the case, that would be a major scientific breakthrough in the understanding of energies and quantum physics. <coughs> and uh, at that point, I think uh, the scientific community would uh, shift their paradigm extremely rapidly, extremely rapidly, uh, hopefully in, in a positive direction. Uh, we would have to insist on no more secret stuff in the back of the government. Okay, that's what I think I know about the ring. Slim, on the manufacturing of the ring, I was first understanding you <coughs> say single wire, let's say with a cubit length. Bend that over, twist it. Then no. you have the twisted end joined with the two ends here. Or can you take two wires, twist them up, and just chop it up into the no, different No, you lines? cannot take two wires, twist it up, and, and make it work that way. Mm -hmm. no, this, this is, this is right. still the, the level of certainty that I have. I wouldn't entrust that process mm -hmm. to anyone. I wouldn't entrust it to anybody. <coughs> Take two reels of wire and try to get the polarities correct mm -hmm. and put one wire <coughs> one way, one wire the other. I wouldn't entrust that to anybody. The chances of coming out and creating a destructive or unhealthy or non beneficial product is something I don't want on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. So we do it the hard way, always. Which turns out to be the simplest and the most correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you just have to do it that way. Uh, we thought about that and we looked at the ramifications and the possibilities and all of that stuff. Yeah, if we had a, a full time turbine who really knew his stuff and was very concerned, it was all hard, uh, that might be done. But the simplicity of the process, why would you bother to go to all the trouble? Uh, just the mechanics of what we're doing is, is so simple. So that, that's why the uh, caveat there. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get it backwards. You right. don't want to start running 
two wires down, twisting them into the you know, same polarity, you're just adding the problem. So I'm still confused as to when you bend it over on itself. I mean, didn't you say that you bend it in half? So yeah, you've got here, here I've got a, a reel of wire on this spool. Okay. Uh -huh. I pull it out, stretch out uh, 25 feet, double it back on itself, clip the two off, catch it in the vise, go down the other end, put my drill motor in and twist it. Okay, so you bend it over and then twist it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, twist it in the normal clockwise fashion. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. After you twist it, just whatever length, you cut it to the 20.6. The math is the, is, the, is the difference between, because you have, a, you, you, you have to twist a longer length of wire to get to the 20.6. Is the mathematical ratio between those two anything similar to pi, like an in, 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 indivisible? I don't know. Uh, we, I haven't taken the trouble to make a precise numeric measurement. Uh, what I've done is is use a just a standard length. In other words, I have my reel at one point uh, and my final vice position. And I pull it to a specific point in the room each time, hook it around a nail, take it back to the other end. And uh, then I'm always spot on. I have a certain tension I use, hook it up, wind it down, and I don't know, I, I lose about that much in length on the winding. And I think I come out with. Uh, Let's see, about 14, 14, 15 feet, 14 feet, I think it is, it's close. Uh, I can get three, three and a half cubic lengths out of the final twist of wire. I think I'm about 15 feet in the loose end. You, it, it's more of an eyeball perception. Now, my son, who's clairvoyant, he tells me, stop right there. Now it's gold. He sees a gold aura appear on, his, on the surface of a specific twist. So he's, he's quality control, and, and <laughs> we just go from here to here and quick. And we're within a, a small fraction on everyone. Yeah, eventually, for those who get into manufacturing and don't have a clairvoyant handy, can you talk a little bit about um, the holoform that you've added to the ring, the, the holoform sound? Yeah, we'll, we'll do that kind of toward the Thanks. process. Here. Oh, that's a good idea. So let's do it now. Uh, we started using the gold and silver plating because our boys kept asking for the silver, and then they said, no, you, you need to put gold on it. It gives it just exactly the right vibration. It really had nothing to do with the cosmetic appearance of the product. And the uh, gold and silver combination with the copper seems to add a very significant dimension to the uh, frequency pattern and the quality of the energy coming off. <coughs> Is that the, the Tibetan formula for the rheumatism rings? Or I have some? no idea. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Does the Tibetans make these uh, bracelets? Uh, some of them are, are bound wire intricate, and some of them are just the metal. And uh, they have those three metals, and they supposedly uh, reduce the, the swelling of rheumatism. Right. I know that uh, uh, the Ayurvedic uh, <coughs> medical group uh, has used uh, gold, silver leaf uh, in their process. And used it dietarily. <coughs> Even as a food. Yeah, as a food. And 
one of the things we're finding is that the, uh, the gold filters, gold and silver, will come off of these units just uh, sitting in a room. There's no wear on them. No wear, period. And that's due to the energy considerations in the ring itself or in the coil. They have this energy flow or production in the units themselves. So even though they're electroplated and should be chemically bonded permanently and forever, uh, we're looking at a far different energy system than if we plated just a piece of wire and laid it out there. It wouldn't change. Centuries and centuries and centuries, it would not change. The plating would not come off. But since we're in this energetic system with the closed loop, <coughs> we're, we're looking at a whole different set of parameters uh, than exist in our ordinary environment. <coughs> the gold comes off, it goes into the aura, where it's needed, probably desperately needed. So it becomes essentially a, an auric nutrition and brings about a balance uh, that we've seen many, many times. Some people have their units, re their personal harmonizer replated uh, every three to four months. Uh, one gal was so vain and cosmetic oriented that she really got upset about the gold coming off. And I looked at her and I said, well, uh, probably it has more to do with your attitude than <laughs> anything else. Uh, I mean, this is a nice gal, isn't it? But uh, she had a bit of ego there, a bit more than either Bob or I could tolerate, and uh, uh, quite pushy and quite aggressive. And uh, by God, she was going to have that cosmetic appearance. She wanted to you know, smile and brag about it. But it would tarnish very quickly. And it was just stuff in her aura. Uh, she needed to balance that with anger and, and mental stuff in her, in her aura. And probably some physical. But it does go into the physical body and it does go into the aura where it brings on the balance. And usually after two or three times, most people balance out. Uh, after the goal is completely come off a couple or three times. Like I said, we're very, very glad to just post each two ways and we'll, uh, we'll process, we'll reprocess. And mend them if possible. You know, if there's something we got squashed or something, we'll try to bring them back to it. The replating is within the cost, the original cost? Mm -hmm. The replating is in within the re original cost? Yeah, we don't charge that. Just post each back and forth. Okay. Uh, we use the two waveforms that uh, <coughs> developed. We have a they're, they're on there and we have the yeah. Walkman's yeah. playing one right now. Mm -hmm. Or the Boombox is playing one right now. Each of these. I'll go into the precise method of how these tapes were produced uh, later. <laughs> Thank you. 
the, the, uh, the second. And this is that same frequency pattern slowed down to one third. Because of the thickness of the glass and the wheel and the speed of the wheel and the lathe doing that, <laughs> there's a high pitched sound also and it drives everybody nuts. But I just kind of, to me it's like music. <laughs> and when I heard that, I was like, sounds like he's cutting glass. <laughs> 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 but when you um, slow down the frequency, it's the sound of the lathe.
form is the Sweat Clear, which is a Fourier analysis, mathematical analysis of the water frequency. This was created by Bob Dredge, but based on the water frequency pattern. Just the playing the tape alone without the harmonizer will do that. Yeah. Yeah. And adding the harmonizer or uh, adding coil to that system really it. Which was the tape that you used to bring the rain to you? Uh, I don't bring <coughs> it to me. <laughs> but in, in here you said something about it rained, uh, uh, the clouds formed and it rained and cleared out, everything started smelling fresh again. Uh, I think Grunewald did some experimental work there. Oh. Yeah, we, we do not do any weather modification or weather control, period. Mm -hmm. That is verboten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No well, weather control. You, you, you we can think. clear pollution without coming under the law, so yeah. that's what we do. Clear pollution. Mm -hmm. And what happens as a result of that is a reestablishment of the natural <coughs> pattern. Uh, Slim, when you, when you mentioned using the harmonizer and the coil with with these these frequencies on the tapes, yeah, we'll um, get into that later, huh? Okay. Well, that, that's a whole schedule of all the program today. Do you play that so you audibly it, or just so it's there but you can't hear it, or is it uh, depending on whether I'm wanting to listen to it or just have it in the room with the, with the harmonizer? Mm -hmm. The third pattern of hearing is the second one, that the second tape we developed, and this is the recording of the environmental response to broadcasting the water frequencies into the area to reduce the pollution. This is what the environment was saying back to us. And the reason we call it grandmother's drum, it sounds like a drumbeat. And it sounds like, in our American Indian tradition, like Granny was saying, hey kids, good job. Uh -huh. We got a nice response by it. And it was a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. <coughs>
beat pattern there as it reaches up toward the end of the sequence where it keeps speeding up uh, adopts exactly precisely the drum beat used by the Southwest Indians in the Hill Trail. <laughs> precisely the same beat. Precisely the same beat as what? The, the, the healing ceremony drum. The healing ceremony drum. <coughs> Precisely the same beat, the same pattern. Now, where are those old cats got that? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in this research work, we've run across all kinds of people with all kinds of experience and knowledge, and we, we played these things. And somebody said, "Oh, it sounds like this, that, the other." They, they pull a tape <coughs> off the shelf and they taken at a healing ceremony and put them on side by side and right down. Not, not a fraction difference. <laughs> you just marvel oh, wow. at how our ancient peoples develop what they do and how they know what's all that sort of stuff. Well, I'm going to do a little more technical stuff on the uh, rain in the water because it has <coughs> major implications for us. Last uh, little water molecule. Here's oxygen and the nucleus here in the center. And here's a hydrogen atom sitting out here, electron orbiting around, electron here. Another hydrogen <coughs> atom, so we've got H2, one, two. Oh, big deal. We all know what that is. Okay, uh, I'm a little off in my sketch here. This angle, <coughs> curiously, is 100, approximately 104 degrees. Curiously, the face angle of the pyramid is 51.51, or approximately half the Ascending passage is 26 degrees, about half of that. The angle of tilt on the Earth, this is the axis. The <coughs> angle in here is approximately 13 degrees. We have 50, 50, 50. If we continue this angle, or again we're pretty close to 104 degrees. Curious, uh, if you control the water on the planet, you control everything. Victor Schauberger warned us that the greatest secret on the planet control of the water. Victor's a guy who did all the work on the uh, vortexes, the natural patterns. Uh, nice little you know, African antelope horn here that is a mathematical nightmare <laughs> to try to describe. Tried to analyze that mathematically. But it's a perfect example of how nature works. Uh, you look at a whirlpool in a bathtub, it has approximately that form. Uh, most of your natural vortexes in water or air have that form. If you look at the surface of the ocean, you see a vortex coming up this way, uh, <coughs> what do you call it, a water spout. There's an opposite 
vortex going down in the water. Curious thing. Uh, if you look at the vortex in you know, the of water, here's the surface. You've got this little vortex going down. There's an equal and opposite vortex going up. Kind of like Gabriel's horn, you might say. Very curious stuff goes on with vortexes. We are creating vortexes with these tools, very slow moving vortex, very slow rotations. The biofield is a rotating vortex. A lot of interesting stuff related to vortexes and water in there. Go ahead and pass that on around. That would be fun for everybody to look at. <coughs> easily mathematically describe that thing, but once you get the feel of it, you know how it works. You absolutely know in your own fiber of your being just how that vortex principle works. So are you saying that the rings, um, instead of going out perfectly cylindrical? It they are perfectly cylindrical, but does it end within up in them, probably on a micro level, on the macro level, it seems to be perfect cylinder on the micro internal structure level. It would be something more like that. Uh, I don't Enormous amount of light 
fluorescent. Uh, reading in the scientific literature and experimental physics, it is extremely difficult to make water fluoresce. They have to use very, very intense sound, very, very expensive equipment, very high power electrical and sound projectors. And the uh, astonishment that this physicist had when he saw us with no power, or what he could see as no power, no electric plug-ins, uh, creating this kind of response in water. I mean, the guy really got excited. Unfortunately, he was under a time deadline. He had to leave Boulder, uh, move back to Maryland, and we never saw him again. But he really wanted to do more research in this area. And I think we would have uh, made a lot better progress uh, had he been available to us. He disappeared into the military industrial complex of whatever, I don't know what he's doing. Brilliant, genius man. And totally astounded at the simplicity of what he was seeing. You know, from a conventional <coughs> physics point of view. So that's what happens to water. Uh, it freezes at lower temperatures, boils at lower temperatures. Uh, if you use water that's uh, potentized, put a ring around your garden hose, uh, your plants do a lot better. Uh, we've seen some rather astounding things happen there. Uh, water the little patch of our uh, backyard flower bed we had uh, bluebells. I think maybe I told this story. Bluebells had never gotten above knee high three summers there. Watered it, let it run an hour or so, really soaked the ground. And bluebell, one stem of bluebells, <laughs> oh my over God. seven feet. Oh. Same number of blooms on it and all that. Much deeper colors and uh, very rich growth. The average bluebells along that bed were this high. The average was over four feet. Uh, last year, the corn on the experimental farm in Iowa produced 190 bushels, where they had uh, the harmonizer playing to get rid of the bugs or just to see what was going to happen there. They got rid of the bugs and grew more corn last year. <coughs> Previous year, didn't see much change in the, in the corn yield. Normal would be 140 to 160 bushel. Good year would be 160 bushel. Last year, 190. And that was with no pesticides. Nothing. I mean, no, no change in practice. 140 with pesticides? Uh, don't know that he was using pesticides or had uh, pretty pretty much an old time guy uh, willing to take his chances but uh, quite impressed with the, the change in yields. This was using the harmonizer or just the water? Yeah, this, this effect would occur uh, if you set a jug of water in a rain or if you turned on the tape and expanded the harmonizer field out to uh, <coughs> all the water in that area would be potentized. So if you got a good storm blowing over and you can turn your unit on kind of a low level and uh, let the moisture downwind you know, get potentized, it creates some really good effects. <laughs> Lots of stuff. We saw in our area, let's see, the first year we were using, second year we were using the uh, our big R2 unit here to clean up the uh, air. We had uh, a really wet spring, I mean super wet spring. And as soon as we turned on the unit, 
and started working with that moisture going up into the hills. Uh, the, the ground suddenly opened up and uh, started absorbing water instead of just running off. Apparently there was no electrical barrier of some kind there. And the, the wells in that area had all dried up, uh, you know, been, been dried up for about 13 years. Uh, mountains were in pretty desperate condition. And the, the wells recharged in about a month. That brought the water level up in the ground. So, after you pulverize the water, is there, does it stay charged? No, uh, it seems to lose uh, about half its charge in 30 days. And you know, it's probably it's a diminishing return there. But it, it would last, you know, there would be some potency at the end of the year, I'm sure. It would be better than tap water. Does it matter how long you put it inside the drain? No. You no, could just it, pass it over. And it's instantaneous. So it's not going to get any more charged by leaving it for several hours or overnight. The only change we see there is when we add the coil and add the feedback loop to the ring, make a, a new circuit, then we get an increase in the level uh, over a 24 hour period. A very significant change. Now, I'll get to that in just a bit. Uh, ring primarily. Uh, or changing vibration, uh, changing structure of water. Uh, some of the physical effects in the body, uh, uh, stuck joints. You know, a lot of people all of a sudden get a click in their joint, they can't make it work right. Or a shoulder gets stiff. Uh, oftentimes a stiff shoulder is a precursor to your signal about uh, heart problems coming up. Uh, you can take uh, a coil, uh, pull out the uh, stuff, or you put a ring over the wrist, up the arm, and exercise it a little bit. And within a few minutes, usually the uh, stuckness in that joint disappears. Is it good arthritis? It very well could be. Uh, we had some good reports on that. Uh, not everybody gets good results, but many people do. Just with the ring. I have a older friend up in his 70s now, has been carrying a small ring in his shirt pocket ever since uh, he got out of the hospital uh, with a heart attack. Uh, his cholesterol has gone down to very, very acceptable levels for a man his age and dietary habits. Uh, he'll have uh, a big prime rib. And a triple banana split for dessert. Oh, he really likes to put it down. And uh, <clears throat> his doctor can't figure it out. He's not taking his quote, medicine. <laughs> and uh, just carries that ring in his pocket. Uh, the doctor can find not at the end of a year, the doctor can find no sign that he had a heart problem. So normally, if you develop a heart problem that they can read on the machine, that will that signature will persist, and you'll be able to find it there, you know, a year, two, three, four years down the road. Doctor told him he's never had a heart problem, hmm. and he asked him what he was doing, and he said, "I pray a lot." He <laughs> 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 didn't want to. Uh, didn't want to curse the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> You know, when can we just start telling the truth about these things without fear of, you know, because, I mean, this is a tendency I think most of us have, and I have too, you know. When you tell the truth, they don't want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. They, don't, they don't listen or they don't want to hear it. I've been shot at more times for telling the truth. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just curious, you know, when, when will it be to where we can? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's coming. It's, it's coming. very... Be when, when nobody goes to them anymore, and they will come. <laughs> well, uh, you do have medical doctors uh, very high up, very well placed in the uh, medical community who are 
starting to use these tools, nor know about them, no practitioners who do use them, have gotten good results themselves, and uh, hopefully they'll get a little more in public. Are they being used? I, I heard they're being used in a hospital in Denver by Bar uh, Barbara Brennan's group, that there's a, a wing dedicated no, to that? No, that's hospital? not in Denver. Where is that? There, there's a lot of stories go around that kind of get fused together. Well, what's happening with so, uh, we have several nurses on the floor who are using the tools clandestinely. Uh, a couple of MDs are not recommending them, but they're using them for themselves and testing them out. Uh, maybe eventually they'll come into the uh, hospitals. Uh, we have a massage uh, practitioner associate who uh, has gotten contracts with the hospital, local, two local hospitals, and she's training a group to go in and do massage and to use the tools right on the floor, right in the hospitals. So I mean, you entered in on that side, but you couldn't bring it in on this side. If <laughs> you go in the front door, you're probably going to run into the local gendarme, uh, if you go in the back door, you know, who cares? So Barbara Brennan doesn't have a group working with them the in Barbara a hospital Brennan somewhere? Group, uh, five, six, seven, I believe, are for trainers who do the training in New York City at their annual or twice annual workshops, are using the tools to uh, discover this were blown away and have introduced it into that group. Now, I don't know that Barbara Brennan herself has endorsed this in the group, but they are being used within that group. And they, uh, the individuals are saying, hey, you guys got to find out about this. Uh, they were completely <laughs> blown away. So she must be aware of it. I would say on some level she's aware of it. I have no idea how her organization works. But uh, the tools are in use uh, in the operating room in uh, at Columbia uh, Medical Research Hospital in I think it's in New York. One of the healers who's being studied there is a very gifted lady. Uh, is taking the tools in the operating room and she's using them right there during surgery. Mm -hmm. I'm not in close contact with her, but I uh, hope they have a chance to visit while I'm back east this summer. Do they have any results back from that? No, I, I haven't heard any results back. There's one case she wanted me to come and work on and that she Crack that one. Katie bar the door. We're on, we're on board. I guarantee you. Let's see. What else do we need to talk about? Oh, blood effects. Ring. Ring and or feedback. We had uh, sample Grenville's blood on the dark field microscope. Had a good picture of it. The blood was all strung together like beads, indicating low oxygen, and it's just called clumping. And we put the uh, energy beam in here from the uh, feedback. We put a ring under the stage, and almost immediately they were separated in normal distribution patterns. So all strung together. And he said that from that sample he experienced in his own body the release that occurred on the microscope stage. You can tell it happened here. So this is one of those radionic kind of things that you can say, well, you know, if you've got a witness or a sample and you do something to the sample, it has the same effect in the body. Uh, That'd be nuts. Mm -hmm. Simple way to do things. 
Uh, this particular slide was still living, uh, active, but uh, hadn't dried out and died off three months later. There were very distinct blue rings, concentric rings of energy appeared around the cells. Where was this ring put? Hmm? Where did they put this ring? Uh, just under the microscope stage, under the slide. And then the feedback loop was, you know, here's the scope slide here. The feedback loop came in at this angle, and we had the ring underneath. But the appearance of those concentric energy rings around the blood uh, was quite startling. Everybody who had any experience with that there said, uh, I've seen blood sample, blood sample, blood sample, never saw anything like it. And that's new phenomenon. what you saw with the microscope. It wasn't like an auric thing. I mean, yeah, you could actually see the blue ring. Right. Yeah, it, you know, it was a faint, it, it was energy, it wasn't something solid, it wasn't like the edge of the cell membrane. These were just concentric rings, and, you know, if you went into the light physics of what you were seeing, you understand that. But, uh, it would be like a rainbow in a real sense, it would be a different refraction of the light coming through, and it manifested as a, a blue energy. What are the effects of this on the DNA? Is there any research being done on that? Currently there is research being done. Um, Glenn Ryan at uh, the, what's he call himself? HeartNet? Uh, Quantum Biology Labs is currently doing some research. I talked with him for about an hour uh, three weeks ago at New Science Conference. And uh, he done a quickie for me uh, a couple of years ago, and he found that it dramatically increased the rate and quality of cell growth uh, in a, in a culture in growing skin tissue. Uh, he hadn't done any uh, look and see at the DNA, but he did report a dramatic increase in the rate and quality of the uh, skin tissue growth might have application for growing skin for grafts and, and that type of thing. Much better quality, much more rapid uh, development. Uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Does it affect bacteria growth? Yeah, bacteria seem to be, certain bacteria seem to be suppressed by the rain. The uh, degenerative and decay organisms are suppressed. Uh, a lot of people are finding that he's wearing a small ring on the arm. Uh, there's an upper arm band or on the wrist. Brings up their energy level significantly. Um, <clears throat> the definition of brainwave patterns, like a person is dyslexic, is there brainwave patterns right now? You told me, somebody told me this. Uh, okay, now Larry was saying that he experienced some significant changes, and I'll let you answer that question. Uh, we also have, a, uh, I don't know what, what the instrument's called, it was done back in Cleveland. There's a clinic back there where they're working with uh, people who have neurological damage, brain damage, uh, dyslexic, uh, various disorders of imbalance in brainwave patterns. And the operator, inventor of the machine and the system, a uh, very well known PhD in that area, uh, doing a lot of clinical work, uh, took one of their associates, uh, put her on the meter or whatever they do, uh, gave her a session with the coil for under five minutes. While she was on the machine, and the graphic representations 
basically you have a straight line showing the right and left hand hemispheric balance. And there was a perfect correlation. Uh, we might do it this way. There was a perfect correlation, perfect balance that occurred in, in just five minutes. Working with the ring? Uh, ring and foil. The, uh, PhD was, again, he was blown out of the water. He said, my God, he, he worked for months to try to balance personnel. And she came along and showed him how to do it in five minutes. So there's another vector if somebody's into that kind of thing and wants to go play with it. Uh, tremendous amount of research to be done. All right. So I'm using the ring versus the uh, first tools that you showed, the uh, blood electrifier. Mm -hmm. Do you need the blood electrifier once you start using the rings? Uh, I think that's probably a good idea. I'm not sure just what all of those considerations are that the body has on that. But uh, I personally have found, even wearing a harmonizer, and persisting in my bad habits as I do. Uh, I, I had a tremendous amount of results with Beck units. I had, you know, you, you've got to get your system cleaned up because you're far out of balance. You have to get it cleaned up. And then I think the, the tools without that would help maintain the balance. But you really got to get your system cleaned up get rid of the bugs and parasites and go through all the uckies that that entails. Uh, by the way, skin parasites are a major consideration. Uh, skin is the largest organ in the body and you'd be surprised how many little widgets you got crawling around. <laughs> you never even notice. They are there. That's probably the subject for a newsletter. It gets pretty damn graphic. But when you've got cups full of worms coming out of your height, uh, soaking a bathtub for uh, an hour in a couple of different preps, and you have these critters exiting your system, you don't care what it looks like. You're glad to be done with it. Okay. So okay, we are out of tape. If we can just stop for a brief. <laughs> I've been sitting on the bench making rings for weeks on end. And of course, you know, diddly diddly diddly, you make a ring, you make a ring, you make a ring. It gets a little boring. So my mind went to what what can we do to change the configuration and what will that configuration do? I, I have no idea. So the discovery was purely out of boredom, uh, purely by chance. I have no idea that the coil or the serpent had a precedent in history. And then, uh, the way I did it, uh, I was very concerned with the polarity of the wire. Because I knew that I had to be very, very careful in laying out the rings to identify the positive and negative side. So with that in mind, I took a length of wire and held the south, what indicates is the south pole or the negative effect. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to have to use that term. Uh, the south pole of a magnet or the south pole of a wire looks red. I indicate that with a counterclockwise motion. <coughs> the north pole or positive end of the wire has a right hand rotation on the pendulum. Okay, the pendulum will rotate to the right. Clairvoyance sees a blue color and the counterclockwise red color has a negative effect. All right. So that's how I strung out the wire. I 
held the wire in my left hand, wrapped it clockwise, as my right hand would indicate clockwise, around the mandrel. Bent the south pole up here to meet the north pole, and that produced a configuration which the clairvoyant told me pulled negative energy in this end and put out positive at this end. So I had a joint here to identify the end. Uh, Bob Gratz suggested the amplifiers, the spherical capacitors uh, that Tesla was using to further identify and amplify the field. Now apparently what happens is right about here, the negative energy is flipped over and becomes positive in its spin. This is quantum level spin. This is down at the micro level. So we're, we're dealing with uh, macro uh, tools, stuff in the macro world, but we're dealing with the micro cosmic, the stuff of <coughs> pure vacuum or the stuff of space. And we're talking spin, we're talking quantum physics, and I have no idea of that at the time. This, this all, everything I've read in quantum physics came after my understanding and the discovery of what this thing does. So I can tell you from my own experience, I've seen the black energy coming out of a person, out of my wife, who came home one evening, actually the next night after I made the coil, she came home with a severe pain in the side of her neck, uh, held the positive end up to her neck. She said, oh my God, my head's getting stuck yet, I don't like it. She turned it over, started pulling the energy out, and that's history, that's where we start. It was five years ago. I gave her a session for about 45 minutes, and this rope, if you like, just a, a cylinder of energy that big around, came out of the side of her neck, uh, through the coil, turned the white energy on the other side, and in 45 minutes, she was totally pain-free. All of her ligaments, joints, tendons, everything had loosened up. Now, we later found out that exactly between five and seven, this point, this acupuncture point on the side of the neck is open. That's when your acupuncture is to work on that particular meridian, at five, between five and seven in the evening. So we happen to be right in the perfect time window for her to release that energy. So if any of you get a hold of uh, you know, a diagram of the meridians that shows the timing, which meridians are open, that will be really helpful in, in doing treatments or giving people an assist. And we can't even say we're giving treatments. I mean, that's forbidden. We can't do that. We can do some research. So uh, if you want to help somebody and you have access to that data, it might be good to write it up, pass it among the group and uh, uh, be able to more precisely help people get rid of their aches and discomforts. I can't say pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the feedback loop has exactly the same function, same pattern, is the coil. Negative energy is drawn in one side and positive energy comes out the other. The artist that did the illustration uh, shows a spray effect, a, a dividing of the energy. It doesn't happen that way. These are just very pencil thin streams of energy going in, coming out. So uh, just keep in mind that these things act like lasers. The energy coming off the positive end would be like a surgical laser and you can go in and break up 
negative energy patterns in the body or in the biofield and the aura. And uh, I very quickly uh, remove them. The flow of energy through the coil is about the same rate as a garden hose would flow. The feedback loop has a flow more like a high pressure car wash. I mean, it's really energetic. So that's the difference between them. They both have the same function, operate the same way, are equally effective, and uh, can be used together. You can put the two of them together, hold one in one hand, one in the other. Uh, you can take one coil in one hand, one in the other, and one drawing and one pushing. And then your hands, your loop here, becomes like a piece. Some of the practitioners use it in that fashion. So you have a lot of different options to play with. My natural energy flow is in my right hand, out my left hand. Mm -hmm. Others may have a different pattern. So just you know, follow your own flow, follow your own pattern when you're using it. So the feedback loop is like a recycler of the energy? It pulls it over the yeah. recycle uh, it? It was designed in technical terms the design was to create a phase conjugate mirror. Okay, that's a, a term in optics which has been transferred into particle physics. When you, uh, and I can illustrate that, I think fairly easily. Let's say you have a, uh, a speaker over here that's putting out a sound wave pattern at a certain frequency. You have another speaker with an identical sound wave pattern and frequency here. Right here is no sound at all. It's zero. It's a phase cancel. Identical <coughs> waves that cancel right here. You can create an absolutely dead silent space with sound. Wow. <laughs> now this is a known physical phenomenon. Known in physics. Optically, and since we're dealing with light, we're probably doing the same thing with the feedback loop. We're taking that negative energy out, returning positive energy at exactly the same frequency pattern as what's coming out, and phase canceling the source of that energy. So that's one way that we look at it. That's our mental picture uh, when we designed and began to use these tools. Uh, the coil, of course, just uh, dumps the positive energy out. It doesn't leave, the black stuff doesn't go through and hang around for somebody else to step in. Difference in dogs. <laughs> Okay, the harmonizers uh, are a tremendous amount of interest here. <coughs> Three sizes, personal, environmental, and agricultural. Um, do we have an ag size? It's right behind you. Right behind oh, okay. the, the, yeah. I wasn't sure if we had one here as a sample. Uh, The experimental work that led up to that, I can demonstrate pretty easy here. The first thing we thought of doing was spinning a ring. So we got a little gear motor that rotated, I think, at uh, 220 RPM, which is a harmonic of the heart rate, heartbeat. So we're spinning it at 240 RPM. That's a slow motor, that's really slow. But the vortex that that thing set up was really phenomenal. Uh, covered probably a, a mile radius. And was really energetic. A little bit too much energy, a little bit too much activity. 
uh, in the area. My wife came home that evening and stepped in the front door, and Bill and I had this thing spinning on. About knocked her over. She's quite sensitive. So we shut the unit down. Uh, Bill took it home, set it up in his basement. He didn't sleep all night. His wife didn't sleep all night. Uh, the telephone didn't work in the morning. Uh, a couple of other things, I forget what it was. But the phone not working, and neither one of them sleeping. And Bill was feeling kind of sneaky about it, so he kept it downstairs and unplugged it. <laughs> didn't, didn't tell his wife. <coughs> About 30 minutes, the phone started working. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, she mentioned that she hadn't slept all night. And he said, well, I have to tell you that I had one of our energy units working in the basement, and uh, I didn't sleep either, and uh, I'm really sorry about that, and I won't do it again. <laughs> so that's how we came to try to find a way to make it not quite so powerful, uh, not have the action in it, and to make the field more stable. When you have a rotating something, you, you have a lot of activity, tremendous amount of action in the ether field, in the gravity field, uh, and you saw from the diagram of the uh, energy field around the harmonizer, uh, the print there in the workbook, that there really is something there. We know that when these rings are in motion, or we have a breeze blowing through them, set them up in front of a fan. Uh, <coughs> for instance, if you just set a big ring under the fan here and let the breeze blow on it, there would be a very distinct uh, increase in the energy down here. Uh, you're vibrating a tensor. It's like a drum head. So if you, you're rotating this thing, you're creating a, a motion with the ring, but also against the static air in the area, uh, you have a relative motion. So you're creating a tremendously amplified field. Uh, it's true in any of these tools. When they are in motion, no matter whether you got wind blowing through them or they're merely in motion and there's still air in the automobile cabin, uh, they are dramatically increased in their effectiveness. Dramatic. Uh, depending on the speed, it can be a hundred to a thousand times more effective. And there's some really neat applications for that. So we, reports on from our, our field reps and uh, experimenters. Uh, Slim, if you spun the ring at six foot height, since it's a cold here at game and you slept down here, would you feel the effect? You bet. But since this is a cold here at beam out here, why would you feel the effect down here? Well, you're, you're setting the ether field in motion. Now we're just like having a 10 mile long stirring arm. Oh. On a, let, let's say you want to stir a vat of something. Okay. It's like having a paddle 10 miles long out here to <laughs> stir the local area. So and you're getting the harmonic or the bounce. Well, you're, 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 you're creating a vortexing action in the ether field or in the gravity field. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, well, it's, that it's not okay to do that. Now, on a very slow rotation, we've had some good results. Like on a can opener speed? Well, no, like on one rotation in 24 hours. One, one rotation in 24 hours seems to be okay to use. Uh, that's the, you know, that's in, in tune with the rotation of the Earth, mm -hmm. and these common little uh, timer systems have a 24-hour clock on them. Yeah, we've used those and uh, glue a table on that, and then make a construction that'll do rain or 
permanent. You can get a really nice uh, action there. Uh, seems to offset some of the other programs that are being beamed at us. You know, just breaks up the patterns that are uh, established artificially. Let's see. Okay, relative field size. Let's set uh, three harmonizers in a row here. This, in relative distances, this field is about five to seven feet. This one is approximately 100 feet. The ag harmonizer field is approximately one and a quarter miles. That's just your radius, field radius. We're looking at something like this, this, and this. Is that one in the quarter? Mm -hmm. Mile and a quarter. That's with no sound. That's just sitting quietly on the table. No vibration to speak of other than you know, ambient sound in the room or something quiet like a fan running or music playing quietly in the background at a distance from the unit. Now, again, the plane of the ring is really important. That's the drum head, if you please. That's the tensor. You know, if you, if you drop a grain of sand on a drum head, you can hear it. Mm -hmm. If you drop a marble on it, it gets a little louder. If you drop a baseball on it, it gets a little louder. Okay, so it's the size of, or the velocity, or the mass of the energy coming against us. Light itself passing through this tensor will affect the quality of the beam coming off. We've taken a, a little pencil lasers and directed that right through the center of the ring. And we found that all of a sudden our fingers get tingling. It sets up a bigger circulation, a bigger current in the ring itself, and creates quite a significant energy effect will modify the entire cylinder of energy coming off the other side, probably in both directions. What do you mean modify? Uh, modified, modulated. Uh, <coughs> uh, let's see, how to illustrate that. Okay, let's take a ring, let's put a laser beam against the plane. The cylinder of energy coming out here is going to have the same frequency, or this whole thing now has the same frequency as the laser beam. You can't see it. You can't see the laser beam unless you've got some cloud vapor or smoke or something in there to see it. But this entire cylinder now has this frequency pattern. Okay. We found that uh, the practitioners who are using the laser for acupuncture, if they had lay a ring on there and <coughs> use the laser, the plant will report much, much, much more rapid effect. They can feel it much more distinctly. And apparently the results are greater using the rain than just the laser uh, puncture itself. Tremendous increase. Same is true for uh, using the uh, tuning forks. A lot of people use tuning forks in healing. Uh, when you put your rings under your work table and use the tuning forks, the rings pick up that frequency, rebroadcast it, 
and you get a much, much improved effect, dramatically so. Uh, a couple of practitioners have been doing that for some time. They said that within two weeks, their own personal abilities went right out through the roof. mind expanded, so to speak, and spiritual developments, uh, a whole range of what we call uh, manifestation uh, abilities uh, dramatically increased as soon as the sound was added to the uh, ring technology. So if this increases and amplifies sound, is basically what you're saying, what if is, as I understand it, what if you've got harmful noises like industrial, you know, sound or, you know, just That's dissonance. why we have the positive energy field coming off both sides of the ring. We found that when you wind the ring properly, you have a positive energy field, it converts any negative energy. In other words, if you, you put a heavy metal sound in here, it does not have the same deleterious effect that the sound itself would have. I, I just haven't done enough research on that, but that's our present perception. Okay. It doesn't necessarily make it really good, but it at least it modifies the negative effects that the sound would have. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a nice little tone. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm, I'm still talking about harmonizing. <coughs> But uh, the ring, of course, is the basic component of the harmonizer. So what we discovered was that if we just took two rings and intersected them, one this way and one this way, uh, we got two beams of energy in a cross form, one going this way, one going this way. Uh, not very exciting. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a beacon at the airport or down here at the harbor. The amazing thing was that when we made the intersection of three rings, all of a sudden we developed a spherical field. I don't know why that is. Uh, just suffice to say that it is so. And now we have a little harmonizer sitting here on this little base and coil in the middle and some couple more. With a hundred foot radius, we add a sound frequency into this that's transmitted into this entire new field. About a 15 mile radius on the environmental harmonizer. We add the, uh, add the sound to the personal harmonizer, we have about five miles. To the environmental harmonizer, we have about 15 miles. <coughs> and on this one, it's somewhere between 60 and 120. <coughs> <coughs> just using the <coughs> Watson earphones or a boombox uh, style of uh, cassette player. They're really enormous energy field, which is incidental, holographic. Any part of this field will reproduce exactly what is happening right here. It's completely holographic. Uh, there is a slight attenuation of effect at a distance. 
it would have quite the same effect 15 miles away. The field is a little bit weaker, but it is identical in frequency. Identical. And uh, the fact that all of this vibration within this space is holographically present at any point, that's the magic of how the air pollution gets knocked out. Because we're vibrating the molecules and increasing, remember here this increase in the electron <coughs> orbit? They were increasing the electron orbit in the entire space for every molecule in there, for every atom. For every atom. Every atom. That, that's a huge amount. That's a huge amount. The energy considerations are absolutely enormous. I don't know that I know how to calculate that. But intuitively I know that the energy considerations are absolutely phenomenal. We here, here's a number for you. To accomplish raising the electron orbit one shell level to make this quantum jump takes ten EV. It's ten electron volts to raise this level one tiny amount. That means that the energy beam from this unit will raise any volume of water that it <coughs> every atom in that volume of water is receiving a minimum of 10 electron volts. Multiply that by the number of atoms. I'm not real good at math, so I'll leave that at mm -hmm. If you placed another harmonizer in the, uh, within the circle of the originator, mm -hmm. would that amplify and continue to extend another circle? Yes, we're currently using in Denver, uh, we have five units in the field. And we have a, a broadcast unit over here on the edge of the field. And they're considerably more than 15 miles apart. Uh, this unit and this unit are pretty close to 60 miles apart. Uh, 